This is Black Market Leadership, the underground resource for disruptors and status quo breakers. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Black Market Leadership. I am really excited. Oh, man, I'm so excited. I have a guest uh, on today who is the director of research and archives at the George C. Marshall Library in Lexington, Virginia at VMI. Uh, just a little background for the audience. I was at VMI for the first time in a quarter century a couple of weeks ago, and I was speaking at a conference. It was great. I met I met so many interesting characters, all the cadets. I saw, I saw barracks. I saw everything. But I got to tell you, for the audience, the highlight of my trip was going to the George C. Marshall Library, the research library, and meeting Melissa here. Uh, it was another world. To me, it's sacred ground. And I, I was so excited. I'm like, Melissa, you got to do a podcast with me. Will you do it? Will you do it? And she uh, kindly accepted. So hello, Melissa. No pressure on you. <laughs> hello, Kevin. How are you this morning? I'm great. By the way, it's a, it's a cool 80 degrees in uh, Arizona. It, are you guys in sub uh, Arctic temperatures in uh, Lexington now? Actually, no. It's in the 50s during the day and the 30s mostly at night. So kind of seasonal. Okay. Okay. So did I get your title right? You are the Director of Research and Archives at the George C. Marshall Library? I am the Director of Library and Archives at the George C. Marshall Foundation Library. So what does that mean? What, what exactly do you do there? Um, well, I am the library staff. Uh, I call myself a lone arranger, which means that um, there's just me, except that I have a lovely group of volunteers who are regular helpers and moving projects forward and getting a lot of things done here that I couldn't do ordinarily by myself. But I'm a librarian in that I connect people to resources, uh, researchers, uh, students, college graduates, and that I um, help them find the information that they're looking for to answer a question or to work on a project or a paper um, or a book. And I also am an archivist in that I'm in charge of the three-story archive vault that we have here with about 500 collections and taking care of them. Uh, we still have some small collections coming in to add to the archive. And so processing papers and pictures and posters and things that come in. Uh, and I stay very, very busy. <laughs> You do, you do. I, I, I just have to, I have to give you so many compliments. It, it was a, such a pleasure meeting you. I so much enjoy the experience. Uh, and just for the audience here, before I went to VMI, the reason I reached out to a library, library was that it, my, the year I graduated, 99, for some reason, I walked into the library and I, I guess I met the director there. I don't know the man's name. And I was just, a, you know, I'm a, I'm a cadet. I'm about to graduate. And he goes, hey, cadet, you want to see something cool? I'm like, yeah, sure. So he, he pulled out these three-page letter from Patton to Marshall, General Marshall. And for the audience, when you wrote to Marshall, you wrote a one-page memo. And that's it. No, no more than one page. He shows me this three-page manuscript from Patton, which half of it's like how God intervened in the battle. He's just rambling on. It's like, only Patton get away with this. And I was like, wow, I was so blown away. So I called I called uh, the the. George C. Marshall Library, and uh, uh, left a message for Melissa. She called back. We connected, and I say, I'm looking for this. I'm looking for that, and you were just so helpful, and I can't tell you. The, the day after we talked, you called me in the morning like, Kevin, I found this document. I found this document. You'll love it. it you, you made me feel at home, and I tell you, I, thank you. I think you were just doing a fantastic, fantastic job, and you shouldn't be a director. You should be like the, the champion, the protector. You got to get you one of those Valkyrie shields and helmets to walk around. Well, I think um, if I were going to have a seal, I think I would choose Pallas Athena for the wax. Um, that We have some collections belonging to wax here. But no, it is an amazing job. Uh, the learning curve never ends. Every day I learn something I didn't know before. Um, and it is always interesting. I meet the nicest people who get in touch with me for various reasons, needing a lot of different resources. I have researchers who come here and literally become part of the family uh, after spending some time here with the material. So it is a delightful job. I tell people I'm the happiest librarian in the world. I love it. So, so okay, so let me, I'm gonna, we're gonna go right for the jugular now. Why should people know about George C. Marshall? 
Well, you know, George C. Marshall didn't make it his business to tell people who he was. He was kind of an introvert with a very public life. And he was a hard worker, but most of the work that he did was in the background. So he wasn't the face uh, that you would see. You know, when we think about the invasion of Europe, we think about Eisenhower. We don't think about George Marshall, uh, but he was in the thick of the planning for that. He just wasn't the public face of it. Uh, when he, he he had many different jobs, uh, his public career, he was chief of staff of the army during World War II. He spent a year trying to broker peace in China after the war. He, he returned to the United States to become secretary of state and people know the Marshall Plan. Uh, and that's when that was created. Then he became president of the American Red Cross. And then Truman called him back one more time to rebuild that military that he had built for World War II as uh, Secretary of Defense for the Korean War. So when Marshall finally got to retire, uh, President Truman decided that he needed something like a foundation in his name and a library archive to house his papers, that his papers shouldn't go to the National Archives, they should be held separately. And VMI donated the land that we're on, and that's how you know this nonprofit organization ended up surrounded by VMI. Um, but we hold Marshall's papers and we hold many others connected to him in time and place, which is super important because, like I said, Marshall didn't make it his business to be out there in front. He wasn't a natural speaker. Uh, he was a hard worker. He believed in doing the right thing, even at great personal cost. And so he uh, was, as Churchill said, the um, the he won the war and then he won the peace. I love and, that. And, and, and then he went about his life. Marshall did not keep a journal. He didn't keep a calendar. He didn't take notes at meetings. He didn't write things down that he didn't have to. Um, there was no self-aggrandizement there. And so he kind of faded a little bit into history because he's not the public face of World War II. We think of MacArthur in the Pacific. We think of Eisenhower in the European theater. We don't think of George Marshall in Washington, D.C., you know, really in, in understanding and trying to control this global conflict. You know, when I was at VMI and I told you, I even told the cadets there, I was talking to him, I knew nothing about Marshall. All I knew was, you know, he won the, you know, I say it's like it's a small thing. He won the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, the only soldier to do it. I'm like, you know, yeah, of course, of course he did. Like, uh, he had these ama uh, amazing feats to be the chief of staff of the army. For the audience here, you got to read about Marshall. And I tell you, especially if you're in business, because Peter Drucker, uh, people who are interested in executive uh, management and uh, leadership development, you're going to read Peter Drucker one day. Drucker said there are really two paragons of excellence, of strategic excellence. One was Alfred P. Sloan. The other was George C. Marshall. So Marshall, for the audience, you, you got to get some books, read about this man. And what's so fascinating is, you know, he, you're right, he was in the background, but he was Eisenhower's boss. People don't realize that. that you know, uh, I, I, there's so many ways to go into this. But what, what I find fascinating about Marshall, it, it really is our culture. Now that VMI got rid of Stonewall Jackson, and I get it, a West Pointer, they got Marshall right in the middle of VMI. Great. I mean, 1901 grad, graduate of, uh, of VMI. To me, what he did, and I, I'm, I'm going to ask you, because there, there's some great quotes by Churchill, by uh, Roosevelt, by uh, Truman. I think even Stalin had great things to say about him. Here's a man who's, who was considered the architect, uh, architect of allied victory, and yet there's hardly anything about him anything uh, there's no weapon system named after him there's no fort so i don't know any explanation to this or or, or do you think people are really learn, starting to re relearn who marshall was today well i think that he did work in in planning he did work in logistics he was in the background uh he was macarthur's boss he was Patton's boss he was eisenhower's boss um, but but he wasn't a boss that you would hear on the radio every night or that you would see in the newspapers on a regular basis. Uh, he worked really hard. And honestly, I don't think he cared who got the credit. He had one goal during World War II, and that was to win the war, to make the world safe for democracy, so to speak, and to bring the men and women home to their families and their friends as quickly as possible. And he didn't let anything get in the way of that. 
And, and so I, I think that you know, we don't see a lot about him. He was approached in 1949 and offered a gold-plated typewriter and a million dollars by the American Overseas Press Club to write his memoirs. And he basically said, mm, you know, I don't think I did that much. What I did was pretty much few and far between, not very colorful. So keep your money, but thanks for the typewriter. <laughs> uh, the foundation wanted an authorized biography of Marshall, and they contracted with Dr. Forrest Pogue to do that. And Marshall did consent to work with Dr. Pogue. Dr. Pogue would submit lists of questions, and Marshall would answer the questions in the recordings. And a lot of research led to the you know first authorized biography, the four-volume Pogue biography of George Marshall. But there have been a couple since then. Um, David Roll wrote one just a few years ago on Marshall, and then Mark Stoller wrote one several years ago uh, on Marshall that is smaller than the other two and is one that you really could read in a weekend. And so we really have here a man who didn't care who got the credit, but just wanted to get the job done. Yeah, it, he really is. I want to say the anti the anti climatic climatic kind of leader. I mean. You know the marketing term is just a it's a non it's a non sexy role. You know he's not the patent yelling, go here do this. He's in the background, but he controls everything, and and that includes promotions. And when I was talking to some of the cadets, you know they all knew that you know he won the Nobel Peace Prize and the chief of staff of the army, which I'm not sure they knew what that actual position was. But I said, you know, you realize when World War II starts, tell me if I'm wrong here, Melissa, didn't he fire 600 senior officers, colonels, and what, like 13 or 15 generals at the at the outset? Well, I know that in the beginning, of course, um, the army that he took charge of on September 1st, 1939, which is the day that, that Germany rolled into Poland, uh, was less than 100,000 men. There was not one complete division in the army. And so they were absolutely understaffed. They had very little budget. Their equipment was old. The training was lacking. They'd never done anything, uh, any kind of training larger than a division. And so he really inherited an army that was not ready to go to war. And I think even in 39, he, you know, he and other leaders in Washington had already realized that at some point we were going to be involved in this war. They weren't sure exactly when or how, but they knew that we would be. And and so he took this nothing, really, this peacetime army spread all over the United States. Uh, he activated the National Guard to create a skeleton to build more army on because you can't have units that have brand new second lieutenants and brand new privates and nobody knows what's going on. At least the part-time soldiers had had some experience and some training. And then he started the work with Congress uh, and with the president to get the money for the infrastructure, for the materials, for the supplies needed to create an army of several million people. Uh, and, and that is an incredible job to do, but it's one that was largely done in the background. Yes, he testified in front of Congress. Uh, yes, occasionally he gave a speech or a radio address, but really, honestly, most of it was behind closed doors. Most of it was done um, in offices. And and so we don't see him in, in the public eye very much. Uh, and I think that that really set kind of his his model for how to work. He He didn't care for interruptions. He, as you said, didn't care for long meetings, long letters, <laughs> long memos, long phone calls. He had a lot to do. And and he thought anything could be taken care of within 15 minutes. I, I uh, and that's yeah. how that's how he, he ran his life, you know, working working for the army. I have a, a document and it's it's free online. Uh if you're interested, you can email me, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say out loud, you gotta email me. Uh it's I, I think it's a questionnaire from Pogue. Or no, no, it, it's it's a discussion about executive leadership and Marshall's topic. I think they talked to several of his biographers and I use this document in my executive, uh, in my executive coaching. And it's marvelous because Marshall in the background, he's about motion, getting things done. He would have these meetings and say, the object of this meeting is to make a decision. 
And it was that simple. If, tell me if I'm wrong. Wouldn't he go around the table? Uh, Caroline, Sue, Mark, John, what do you think? Get 10, well, five, 10 minutes to tell me what you think. And then boom, make a decision and keep that ball moving. Keep that ball moving. It's just, it's fascinating. Yes, exactly. He also, one of his leadership characteristics was to hire the best people. I mean, really put the best people in positions. Uh, give them the knowledge and the authority to do their jobs and then get out of their way and let them do their jobs. He said he wanted people to make the decisions that they were empowered to make and then tell him about it later. He did not want to be consulted for every single small decision because he depended on his subordinates to do their jobs. Uh, and, and in the beginning of this, getting ready to build this army, there were a lot of men in the army who were aging out. And in the in the interwar years, retire, retiring them wasn't something that was perhaps done as regularly or as strenuously as Marshall felt like they needed to do. Uh, he recognized that in a you know a world war, and and he could see that this was going to be that kind of war. You can't have geriatric generals. <laughs> <laughs> and and so one of the things that he did was he started these maneuvers that were four level army level maneuvers that the mil the army had never done before. Uh, the most famous is the Louisiana maneuvers of 1940 and 41. And he chose someone that he felt like he could trust and sent down there to watch, literally <laughs> to grade the generals. Every single one, National Guard or regular army. And this information done by General Leslie McNair was then sent to Marshall in a document. And McNair was very frank. He would say, needs to go sooner rather than later. <laughs> uh, not much experience, mm -hmm. but, you know, bodes well. Um, I think really could be outstanding. I think it's ironic that at the time, because Eisenhower was not a division commander, he's listed as an other in that <laughs> list. Um, and I also think it's interesting that Patton, he listed Patton as division, his ceiling. Ceiling. Oh. Yeah. He did <laughs> not think, he did not think that Patton should have more than a division. Um, he saw him break the rules during the maneuver to try to get the upper hand. And he felt like he was a bit of a of of an uncontrollable character, a loose cannon. Uh, but but this information really led to I think what you were talking about in in you know the the large retirement of a lot of senior officers. In fact, Marshall himself, after his first um, go round as chief of staff, which lasts three years, and he was asked by the president to stay, he had to get an exception because he was over sixty. Wow. So, so the the army needed um, needed people who physically could do the job of conducting a war. I think one of the most fascinating elements of uh, of Marshall, uh, you know, obviously World War II, a bit that World War II is so complicated. There's so many moving parts. There's so many personalities. To me, one of the most fascinating elements is his his World War One days because he had he had I mean you talk about an opportunity people this guy was hanging out with uh um in fact the story uh, how they met with General John Pershing this was the commander of all the Allied forces in, during World War One uh, over in Europe and the story is that uh, there's some division uh, Marshal was a major and his commander uh, tell me is, is it like a brigade or and then there was a division commander. And they're not, they're not, uh, they're not ready. Or Pershing doesn't think he's think he's ready. So Pershing comes and basically chews out the division commander. Marshall steps up, and says, "Hey, sir, this is not fair. You know, it's your staff." Blah blah blah. And Pershing turns around, and Marshall grabs him. He grabs him by the arm and says, "Turns him around." He's like, "No, sir." And he starts talking. And Pershing was so taken with his his certainty, his confidence, his ability to speak truth to power, as we like to say, that he got under the wing of of. Uh, of Pershing and what a marvelous marvelous to be to be uh you know to have not your sponsor your your mentor to be the head of all the uh, the American forces in Europe and, and he really really capitalized on that relationship didn't he I think so I think Pershing recognized someone who was going to tell him the truth no matter what and you know being general of the armies that's a valuable commodity <laughs> because a lot of people are going to tell him what they think he wants to hear and so he had someone that he knew he could count on for the unvarnished truth. 
he pulled Marshall up into a first division uh, from first division into general headquarters. And they discovered that Marshall had a talent for logistics, for planning. Uh, and Marshall kissed the chance of being able to lead troops into battle goodbye at that point. I don't think that that he was after they discovered that talent and that ability that he was ever going to have a chance in World War I. And of course, he never had the chance to do that in World War II either. Um, but in general headquarters, he, as a as a colonel, um, actually as a uh, temporary colonel, let's put it that way, yeah. um, got to see the, the machinations of an army. And this was an army that had never fought really outside of the United States for the most part, they really had never participated in an international war on this scale, certainly. The French and the British had been at this for several years. They were not terribly trusting of these green Americans. Um, and Pershing had the audacity to say, I do not want my troops spread out amongst the British and the French. They will fight on their own. And so Marshall was set to planning saint pierre which was the saint pierre was the first operation that the Americans were going to do on their own. And when he saw the maps that they had for that battle, he tossed them aside and he chose to go out at night uh, into enemy territory to scout the lay of the land and then come back in the morning and draw his own maps because he didn't feel like he could plan this battle that was so important for the United States without seeing the land for himself. And I that set... Um, a precedent for him to go and see, to get in the weeds, to see for yourself the training, the operations. Uh, you can't just take the reports that hit your desk. And so he he plans this battle. And, and while he's doing this behind the lines, nighttime, you know, surveying, uh, he's in danger, of course, of being captured, but he's also in danger for his, from his own field artillery, which is being fired at night every so often, rather irregularly, just to keep the Germans awake. Um, and for that, he was actually awarded a silver star, which and a lot of people don't know. Um, but And then after San Miguel, we have straight into the Meuse Argonne. Uh, and how do you move thousands of troops and all the equipment on muddy roads without the Germans knowing about it? it what was it like? Was it half a million? It was, it was inc insane it was amount. Huge, huge logistical issues and you know the roads weren't made for that kind of travel we're talking about rural france and you know in, in in 1917 and 18 yeah so so you know this is just really um almost an impossible feat but but he accomplishes it after the war pershing chose to keep him on as his, his um aide-de-camp and so marshall did a lot of traveling and he met a lot of influential people he met General Fox Connor, who was Eisenhower's um, boss and and remained his friend and advisor throughout Eisenhower's career. So, so I think that he really had a chance to see the upper echelons of how the army works. And I think that played into his future, although at the time he didn't realize that. I, I, I've always just been amazed... Uh... For me, I was infantry. I wanted to be in the battle. And, you know, you mentioned that he uh, he basically took the back end job, you know, doing the real hard logistical work, which I I always like, no, get me away. But boy, how important that, that work is. But just the fact that he, uh, I won't say he deferred, but this happens in World War II. He, he, for people who are listening, when you become an infantry officer, most people, I think, uh, you want to fight. You join the army to fight, not to, to to count beans and pass out socks or draw roads. It's out there to be in combat. And two times, two times in the marshal's career in World War One and World War Two, he has denied that opportunity. I mean, he it was his name during uh, World War Two. He was supposed to lead the invasion of uh, of Europe, D Day, right. right? Right. And you know, again. Um, when the time came to make the decision, they, the combined chiefs, the British and American chiefs, uh, the President Churchill, they were all at a conference in North Africa. And President Roosevelt sent Harry Hopkins down to talk to Marshall and ask him, do you want to lead the invasion of Europe? We have to make a choice here about who's going to be the Supreme Allied Commander. And Marshall's response was, please tell the President, I cannot have any input 
whatsoever on that decision, that I will abide by whatever decision he makes. And so Harry Hopkins tells the president this, and the president says, well, I cannot sleep without Marshall in Washington. He is the only one that understands this global war. And so I know that Harry Hopkins must have dreaded to go back down and tell Marshall, I'm sorry, you're not going to be the one. But when he told Marshall, Marshall didn't even miss a beat. He said, well, Eisenhower is your man because he's been part of the planning and training for this operation and because he works well with the British. One of my and favorite. In fact, there, I'm sorry. there is a little note. I have a copy of it. The original is at the Eisenhower Library where uh, Marshall writes, you know, that General Dwight D. Eisenhower will be the Supreme Allied Commander for the invasion of Europe. He has President Roosevelt sign it. And then Marshall writes on the bottom, Eisenhower, I thought you'd like to have this for your files. <laughs> oh my God. He, Marshall has this quote. I love it. Now, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it. I, I'm, hopefully, I'm not going to butcher it, but it's basically, in essence, uh, oh gosh, now I'm really going to butcher it. It's, in essence, you put, you always give 100% when you want to do something, but when, you, when you're given an order that you don't want to do, you give it 110%. You never, never disrupt the uni the unified team. You're always with the commander. You're always with the leader. So if you get an order you don't like, put that extra energy in to, to ensure that they know that you are happy to continue as as, as things are. Do you, do you know that quote? Because I'm sure I just totally butchered it. I do know that quote. He has a couple of really interesting quotes about orders. Um, he said on one that um, the, the commander who doesn't um, work the order to its nth degree is a bad example to his soldiers because his soldiers won't work the orders that the commander gives them. They see the example of the commander being sloppy or, or haphazard, then the soldiers are also going to be haphazard. And so he said, it's really important for discipline, you know, and for the coherence of your unit that any order you're given, you know, you work it completely through. Uh, he also, he also said that, that, you know, basically you don't have to agree with every order that he, I think what he was trying to say is, you don't know all of the deliberations that went into the making of the order. You don't know all of the circumstances. You you can't tell, you know, why at this point, maybe. But, but you know, it's a legal order. You carry it out. And you carry it out and you make sure that everyone who serves with you carries it out. Um, and, and, and then generally, I think the why came later. Uh, a good example of this is actually Patton. <laughs> Patton opened his mouth and said some really awful things at Nutsford, England, at the opening of an, um, an all allies services club. And he basically says, well, it's a really good thing that our soldiers get to know each other because after the war, the Americans and the British and the Russians are going to, to rule the world, basically. And the French said, uh, excuse me. <laughs> And it hit the fan in the newspapers in America. And so Marshall gets in touch with Eisenhower and what the heck? And Eisenhower says, and this is a quote, Patton has broken out again. Broken out. Yeah. And and so um, Eisenhower says, if you want, I will relieve him of command. And Marshall says, hold it. You're the Supreme Allied Commander. You have to make that decision. And I will back you 100%. And Eisenhower says, well, I think we need him, but I'm going to tell him he can't talk to anyone anymore. No speeches, no press, no radio interviews, nothing. Or he's on the next plane back home, relieved of command. And Marshall says, okay, I'll support you in that. On its face, it looks like Eisenhower is playing favorites and giving Patton another chance where ordinarily he would have been relieved with cause. But we don't know the whole story mm -hmm. because only about Four or five weeks later, Patton leads the ghost army in the invasion of Europe, which is extremely important to the success of the landings in Normandy, mm -hmm. because the Germans knew Patton from North Africa and from Italy some, and knew that he was one of the few generals that had real combat experience in this war, and they were scared of Patton. They thought Patton was the best general we had. And of course, Patton was going to lead the invasion of Europe because he was the best general we had. And so Patton's sitting at Pas de Calais with all the blow up tanks and the <laughs> artificial ghost army really caused the Germans to divide their, their forces. 
because they weren't sure exactly where we were coming ashore, but they really thought it was probably Patica Lake mm -hmm. because that's where Patton was. So you can see, knowing the whole story, why it was necessary to keep Patton in theater. That's amazing. I, there's another story. Now, I, I read this years ago, and, and I, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you, this is what I know about it. And I, I'm assuming, uh, again, I feel like you have a PhD in Marshall, but there's so many moving pieces. So I will not hold you ac uh, accountable. There's millions and billions of pieces of information about World War II and Marshall. But there's a story, if I remember correctly, it's Eisenhower screws up in North Africa. Uh, there, there's, there's some kind of incident where it makes it, he looks really bad. And it almost came close to Marshall firing him. But for some reason, uh, the screw-up was fixed. And Eisenhower, to my knowledge, sent a letter saying, hey, basically, think, thanks, boss. Thanks for not firing me. And Marshall's response was, if you did screw it up, I would have fired you. I mean, like, Eisenhower, you could tell, was like trying to play favorites. Hey, hey, thanks for loyalty. And Marshall's like, no, no, no. If, you, if this had happened, you'd be out. And, and I exactly. think that, that was a reality check to Eisenhower. Well, I think it was a reality check to a lot of the generals. I mean, you know, there are some generals he did relieve. Stillwell, Joe Stillwell is, is one of them. Um, you know, Joe Stillwell was not getting the job done in the CBI theater. Uh, and he actually had the nerve to call um, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek peanut to his face. Um, and was very dismissive of, of you know, the, the Chinese military. Um, and and Mountbatten went to Marshall and said, hey, this is just not working. And Marshall relieved him. Wow. He didn't want to, but he did. And he'd known Stillwell for many years. In fact, Stillwell was on his, you know, staff at the infantry school um, in the 30s in, in you know, where, where he redid the, the curriculum there. And, and so, of course, they were close, you know, comrades, co-workers, but he relieved him. You know, Tom Ricks in his book, The Generals, and I really enjoyed that book. I really enjoyed it. In fact, that's where I really started to learn about uh, Marshall. I was like 10 years ago. But Ricks made the point that the firings that Marshall did, they were not uh, punitive. They were, you know, I think people think, you know, you're fired, like, oh, you're an awful person. Marshall's like, you're just not right for this job. You're not right for this role. In fact, other Stillwell what actually went back into circulation, right? He took command again. So it wasn't a career killer, but that that's the thing about Marshall, his focus. It was about the role. And you had to be a good team player. You had to be, uh, you know, don't, uh, gosh, wasn't there an army general who made fun of the Navy, wrote a poem, and Marshall almost fired him for it? Like, you don't, don't, don't talk, talk about our sister services like that. Well, you know, Marshall was a big one for cooperation. Um, in some of the first meetings before the war, before we got involved in the war with the British, Marshall saw the cooperation that the British services had amongst each other. And he wanted that for us. He said, you know, we cannot be an equal partner with the British if we're not cooperating as well as they are. And so he really got this idea for what we now know as the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, and he planned it. And he suggested Admiral Leahy as the first chairman of the Joint Chiefs because he was Navy, which he knew would appeal to Roosevelt. <laughs> but also he was retired. He was called back onto duty for that. He didn't owe anybody anything. Wow. So he really came in with the ability to listen to all sides and make choices and decisions because he was retired. You know, nobody was holding him to anything. Um, and and he also, although the Army Air Corps, which became the Army Air Forces, was was subordinate, you know, Hap Arnold was subordinate to him because it was still part of the Army. He elevated Arnold to an equal position on the Joint Chiefs um, because he thought that they needed to have the same kind of cooperation. And the Joint Chiefs, while maybe not friendly in that they, you know, had... Um, when it went to the movies together or anything, but but when they were all in town, they had lunch together every single week. Wow. So that there could be open and honest communication so that they could know each other more than just the person in the office down the hall. And I think that that, that insistence on that cooperation uh, really was very helpful to to, you know, especially when they had to make some hard choices. They wanted to have the cross-channel attack in 1943. They couldn't do it because they didn't have enough landing craft because the landing craft were all in use 
in the Pacific, Pacific. because every island invasion required landing craft. Um, and that was a time when the Navy got the material and the Army didn't. Um, so, so they were able to work together and make those choices that allowed the material to be used intelligently. Excuse me. That, that's fascinating. Um, I heard this. I, I don't know if it's true. Actually, I don't doubt. I don't doubt that's not true. I think uh, was it four? Was it three or four or four out of five of the of the Joint Chiefs? I'm, I'm, maybe it, it was seventy five percent of them had an Article Fifteen in their in their previous lives. <laughs> It's very, no. it, it's a different <laughs> army. It was a different, no, which is cool. I mean, you know, because you're going for talent. Uh, I, I love that. Yeah. I, I love that story. Um, well, I mean, it's amazing that, that Marshall didn't end up in the USDB at Fort Leavenworth after grabbing Pershing. Oh. I mean, you know, that's an assault <laughs> on a senior officer. Um, and, and I think that it's no secret that King um, had one mood and it was angry. <laughs> And and so I'm I'm not sure that that you know I'm sure if we looked at Admiral King's uh, career we might find some oopses in there, uh, but I think that that it is it was talent and it was the fact that although Marshall might not have cared for King as a person, um, he certainly worked well with him, and 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 that was so necessary. You couldn't let the personality conflicts interfere. Um, you know, Marshall was actually very good friends with Patton. Um, Patton, of course, was quite the equestrian. He had been in the Olympics. Um, and Marshall loved riding. And they lived across the street from each other at Fort Myer. And so, of course, you know, they were friends. But it didn't keep Marshall from telling Eisenhower, look, if you want to relieve him, I'll support you. I read, I, I asked you about this um, and you said it, it's probably made up or, or it is made up, but there's a time where um, it was after D-Day and or ma ma around that time, around 43, 44, obviously. Um, but Pat knows he's in deep, he's in deep trouble. And there's a dinner with Marshall there and Patton's giving out toast to VMI and the great VMI men. And, you know, uh, it just as a way to kiss butt to his boss. Is, is that true? I actually have never come across it, but I'm not going to put, I'm not going to say that it's not true. I'm just going to say, I don't know. Um, because it does actually sound like something perhaps. It does. Do. It totally does. Uh, you know, I think that people are, would be shocked to find out how much time Marshall, who, you know, even, even as army chief of staff spent in Europe after the invasion. You know, I think people have the idea he sat in Washington and just sent out radio messages for everybody telling them what to do. But, you know, remember, he he realized a long time ago you had to go and see. Mm -hmm. And so the combined chiefs of staff and Prime Minister Churchill were in Normandy six days after D-Day. Wow. Six and we days. had just a small toehold on the continent at that point in time. Oh, that's because amazing. He felt like it was necessary to go and see why are we not making the progress we thought we would be making? Oh, well, they're called hedgerows and they're really big. <laughs> um, you know, he wanted to go talk, not, you know, he listened to Bradley on the beaches. He talked with Eisenhower inland, but he wanted to talk to the infantrymen. He wanted to find out things. And, and I don't know exactly what he asked, but I would think it would be things like, it's a week into this. Have you had a hot meal yet? Mm-hmm. How's your ammunition holding out? Are you taking care of your feet? Yes, yes. So important for the infantry, right? Yeah. Um, and, and he wanted to go and see for himself so that the choices and decisions they would make back in Washington would reflect the reality of the situation and not a sanitized report that landed on his desk. Uh, he was also in Italy, um, you know, during the campaign up the boot. Uh, there's a lovely picture. I won't say, well, maybe it's not lovely. I think it's lovely. But there's a picture of Marshall in something that looks like bunny boots and a big coat over a coat all bundled up in the cold, frozen land um, in Italy talking to the soldiers. Marshall lost a son. He lost a son in the Italy campaign. Right. Well, you know, his second wife, Catherine, had three teenage children when they married and Alan was the youngest. He and Catherine were the only ones in the immediate family that called him George. The other two children called him Colonel because that's what the rank he held when they met him. Um, but he was very close with Alan. Alan was a tanker. When Alan went into the military, 
Um, he asked Marshall to be completely oblivious to that, not to pull any strings, not to do anything at all. Um, nobody even knew that Marshall was his stepfather in throughout training. Wow. And so he was assigned to a tank. Um, you know, he, he was a tanker. And, and you know, the, the Battle of Anzio, he's near the beach. He, he pops up out of the tank to take a look around, and he's killed by a sniper. The timing of this could not have been harder for Marshall and for his wife, Catherine, though, because it was a week before D-Day. Oh, my gosh. And so he could not even take time off to comfort his wife and to travel with Catherine to New York, where Alan's wife and little baby son were living with her parents, and to tell her that Alan had been had been killed. Catherine had to do that by herself. Amazing. Oh, just so, the, the so, pressures. Mm. Well, you know, here we have even the chief of staff of the army is not immune to loss in war. You know, he, he mm -hmm. was not protected or insulated from that just because he was chief of staff. He suffered the same grief that every other parent, family member did who lost someone. I want to ask you, I want, I want to flip this. Uh, I have a, I, I adore Marshall. I, I really enjoy uh, reading about him, learning and learning about him. But uh, I have backed away from being a Marshall file. Uh, I don't worship him as a he uh, as a uh, as a man with without error without uh, you know uh, stains. I mentioned the the name Frendall to one of my to a buddy of mine, and he's like, "Who?" And Frendall was uh, a protege, a protege of Marshall, and that guy uh, with this invasion of Africa or North Africa, right? And he's hundreds of miles in the rear, uh, just totally detached, and they had to fire him. Is that correct? Well, he did relieve him. That's right. For not doing his job. And again, it was someone that he had worked with closely uh, before the war. Um, I think it would be wrong to think that Marshall walks on water. Mm -hmm. I think that does him a disservice as a person. It makes him a flat Stanley. Yes. Um, yeah. That that he definitely was human. He had a temper. Um, he didn't show it very often. Uh, one of the times he did is a story told by um, Master Sergeant James Powder Marshall did not have an aide-de-camp because he and Catherine liked their privacy at home. And usually an aide-de-camp would live at the, at the house with the general. But he did have a driver, Master Sergeant Powder, who was six foot four and weighed about 240 pounds and was also kind of his security, really. Um, but they had traveled down to Georgia in, in, oh, probably late November to see how the training was going at one point. And and a senior enlisted guy pulled Sergeant Powder aside and said, hey, you know, um, we're living in these tar paper shacks. We don't have bedding. We don't have, you know, the winter um, bedding that we need. We don't have stoves in these. There's no heat. You know, it's 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 really we, we've got a, a large number on sick call just from living in these conditions. And I grant that when we go to war, it's going to be like this. But let's not kill them off. <laughs> just training them by everybody catching pneumonia. Mm -hmm. We need blankets we need coats we need heat and and so so on the way back to dc powder tells marshall hey this is the situation down there and marshall's glad to know that so when he gets back he says get in touch with quartermaster and tell him get that stuff down there to them in georgia so that they can they can train in health mm -hmm. um they go back to visit again a couple months later we're into january now and that same senior enlisted guy pulled um, Sergeant Powder aside and said, well, thanks for nothing, bud. We has still don't have anything we asked for. So when Powder tells Marshall this, Marshall erupts. And he calls the head of quartermaster into his office in D.C. And he gives him holy hell. <laughs> and he basically said, I don't care what you have to do. You will get them every damn thing they need today. Not tomorrow, not next week, today. Or you answer to me. Um, because I think it truly did matter to Marshall that this, he, one of his famous quotes is, I care that the soldier has his pants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to give the soldier the equipment and the tools and the training he needs to do his job. You can't expect him to exist the way that First Division was existing in World War I. Before, yeah. you know, when, when, when you know, be, that, that's part of what Pershing was fussing about. 
um, was that they didn't have what they needed and they didn't. He didn't want that to happen again. So so Marshall had a temper. Um, Marshall was was very private. He didn't participate in a lot of things. Um, he, you know, President Roosevelt would invite everyone up to Hyde Park for a long weekend and he and Catherine wouldn't go. They would, in, he would invite them to, to sit out on this yacht, the Sequoia and the Potomac and catch what breeze there was in DC in the summertime. And they didn't go. Um, and I think that part of that is he did retain a distance mm -hmm. from the people he worked with so that when he had to make hard choices, they didn't feel like they could ply him with, oh, but you're my buddy. So you're going to do it my way, right? Um, and, and and some people then thought he was cold. Oh, that yeah. He wasn't, <laughs> you know, he he wasn't a very friendly person to them. He 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 looked looking back when he was doing the interviews with Dr. Pogue, looking back, he said that one of the biggest mistakes he ever made in his entire career, and think about all the things he did in his career, was was having African American soldiers train in the South, southern United States for World War II. He said the conditions that they had to live and train under were inhumane. He said, but I didn't feel like I had a choice because you could not train 365 days a year in Michigan or upstate New York. Mm -hmm. The weather was too bad. Yeah. And, and, and he said it was necessary, but I regret it. I wish I hadn't had to have done that. It's a fascinating so choice. Yeah. He certainly he certainly was one that recognized his own imperfections. Uh man, that story <clears throat> it's so it's so interesting to me because I know he has the regret after the war and but the war is going on and he made a conscious choice I cannot divert time and energy for uh for you know, I don't know, the social change right now even though it is necessary. I can't, we can't do it. It's just so focused on winning uh, our, 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 his job, fulfilling his role, you know, and there's that great video for the audience here on YouTube. There's a one, magnificent video of uh, oh, the big actor, uh, Orson Welles interviewed at the Dick Cavett show. And they yeah. asked him, who's the greatest man they ever met? And he says, George C. Marshall. And they're like, really? And he gives this amazing story. And I told you when I met you, even though uh, Marshall, you know, uh, it was in the 50s when he did the Marshall Plan. When I went to VMI, my grandfather was a World War II vet. He was in the 17th Airborne, captured by the Germans, captured. And uh, totally uh, would, would never own a weapon after the war. But he was so happy that I went to VMI. But you know why? He's like, Marshall went there. My, my grandfather loved Marshall. Didn't know much about him, but loved him and hated Patton, which, which is probably more common than I think people realize. Actually, I think your grandfather and my dad probably would have been friends because my dad didn't <laughs> care care for Patton. He didn't care for MacArthur, um, but he loved Marshall. He said Marshall was a soldier's general. Yes, yeah. Um, just a fact. I mean, I feel like we we talk hours and hours on more. I mean, obviously hours. I mean, you you. I was there for two days. You you brought this these boxes of old documents that I'm reading about the joint uh, the the joint. The combined, it was a combined chief of staff. Anyway, it was after D Day. Churchill's like, hey, we should send forces. We should divert them south uh, into from Italy uh, further into, into Europe. And they're like, no, we're going to stay focused. And I'm reading these documents that you provided me. And I think I got through maybe 20 documents. And you have three stories, three stories in the building of documents. I have um, in the vault, which is. I, we call it the vault because it's kept behind a bank vault door. Some of the papers were still classified when this building was built in 64. They're not now. Um, but but there are 285 boxes of Marshall's papers. And the government didn't start keeping Marshall's papers until he came to D.C. in 1938. Wow. So anything before that is just what he kept himself. That's amazing. Um, and And so they're voluminous amounts of papers in there and a lot of them you can't get anywhere else you know marshall's papers are here the originals are here they're not at the national archives so so we have this incredible treasure of knowledge that we'd like to share with the world which is why we're working on digitizing the collection it's amazing it is absolutely amazing and when i went to that room uh with the green carpet it, it you're gonna laugh it reminded me <laughs> 
I was like, remind me of VMI, like obviously, but it, you know, it's got the 1960s, 70s look to it, or maybe the 50s look. It, it's got the uh, the essence, the air, the carpet, the books. Uh, oh my gosh, you have the uh, Academy Award for the movie Patton there. You have Mussolini's sword, which is probably taller than Mussolini himself. <laughs> And, and you had the gold typewriter that when Marshall was offered that one million and the gold typewriter, he's yeah. like, no, thanks for the million, but I'll keep the typewriter. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, it's just, it is amazing. And, um, and the way I, I got to watch you in action and the way you treat people, the way you, uh, you, you guide them in, how clear you are, the respect you pay to the books, the paintings, uh, this is like sacred territory to me. This is like a holy ground. And I, I cannot think of anyone better to be in the position to be the protector of the library than you. So I hope I'm make, not making you blush, but I really, you're the perfect person for this because you got the energy, you got the kindness and just the respect for it. So my hat's off to you. I think you're just doing a wonderful, wonderful job there. Thank you. Every morning when I open the vault, I turn on the light and I say, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> because it's not just papers and maps and posters. It's not just books and things. It's experiences. And the people who gave us their collections trusted us, trusted me now to protect and to share their stories, to protect their things and to share their stories. And that's what I love doing. Uh, I didn't know when I went to library school, I would become a storyteller, but it makes me so happy to be able to share the stories of people. Some of them well-known like Marshall or James Van Fleet, some of them you know, a boy who grew up on a farm in Western Virginia and served in the trenches of World War I, or a high school teacher from Richmond who was in the first women's army auxiliary class in July of 42. Uh, it's great to be able to tell their stories so that they're never forgotten. It's, you are the perfect person for this. And it's such, uh, I can't, just, I can't throw so many, too many, too much accolades on you. You, you really deserve it. Cause uh, again, uh, I told you, you asked me, you come back to VMI? I'm like, eh, probably not. And you're like, you're coming back to the library. Go, mm -hmm, yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I have to. Um, tell us about the library. You, you guys have a bunch of events, and I can't believe when I left, you had the CIA, the the historian of the CIA there two days after I left. Oh, <laughs> oh, I was so upset. I watched it on YouTube Live. It what? It was magnificent. It was a, yeah. it was so interesting. Can you, tell us about the events you uh, you've done so far. Okay, so we do have regular speakers here at the foundation. Uh, that talk about things that are connected to Marshall in time and place. Sometimes they're they're very Marshall specific, like Dr. Robarge from the CIA. Um, he just published a book on Marshall and intelligence, which is, by the way, freely available as a PDF download on the CIA website. So go for it. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but but we do have these these presentations. Uh, they are live streamed. So for people who can't journey to Lexington, Virginia, they can watch them in real time. And if that doesn't work, then they're immediately put up onto the George C. Marshall Foundation YouTube page, where they remain freely available forever and ever so that people can watch them whenever they wish. Oh, that's um, yeah. We also have uh, what we call the Marshall Foundation Scholars Program which is open to undergraduates, usually in their junior or senior year, who are writing a, you know, a, a, a senior paper, you know, a final thesis um, paper, and they use the materials here. We have a fellow, Dr. David Hine, who works with them on the writing, and I supply them resources and connect them when they need resources from another organization with that organization so that they can come and research there. And then the best paper of the year has a chance to be published in the Marshall Magazine. So an undergraduate can leave college with a publication, which is kind of a big deal. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, it really is. Um, I do host classes who come to visit college, um, high school, who want to come and know more. Um, family groups will call and make an appointment when they're traveling through, and I'm happy to host them. Of course, researchers. Um, from the United States and from abroad who come to work with the papers and the collections here. So I stay very busy. I love the people I work with um, and I love the people who come in here and want to know more. It's such a, it's, it's such a beautiful, it's a beautiful area. 
uh, boy, I came at a perfect time that the, the leaves uh, turned, uh, but man, it was, it was, I, I can't speak highly enough uh, of uh, the library and your work. How can people reach you? Um, they can reach me at mdavis at marshallfoundation.org. And certainly if they want to know more about this gigantic project to digitize all of the Marshall papers, please give me a holler if you want to know more about it. I love that. And uh, I'll have your, your info, your bio info, um, all that available uh, in the description of the video in the podcast. So people reach out. I cannot, again, people, you got to go to George C. Marshall Library. You can say, you can say hello to the cadets of VMI, but go to that library. It is amazing. It, you're going to a different world. So Melissa, hats off to you again. Uh, Thank you. Keep up the great work. And uh, man, I, I'm just, I'm so happy I got to meet you. You really made my trip. So thank you. Thank you. I really, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I look forward to having you come back and do research. I'm coming back. Count me in. Well, people, there you go. Thanks for listening for this episode of Black Market Leadership. Contact Melissa. I tell you, it's a treasure trove, a treasure trove of materials for you. With that, I'll talk to you next time. If you like this content and want to hear other things like it, head on over to the website at blackmarketleadership.com. That's blackmarketleadership.com. There you can subscribe to the podcast and you can even create a free member's profile 